Good morning, everybody. I think for some of you, it might not even be morning. It's wonderful to have people joining us from across the world. So it's my great pleasure. I'm Denise, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this mini symposium organized by Lindy. Um, I really enjoy these symposia when they're held in the Barclay Room in the college, and it's such a sad situation that we're not all able to meet face to face but it has got a positive and that is that we've been able to involve people from a much wider group and I don't think we all would have fitted in the Barclay room very easily. I see there's 34 participants at the moment. I think we'd have been a bit squashed Lindy. Um, so it's going to be a really fantastic uh, morning I'm sure and I think we're all very interested to hear the four talks. It's my uh, opportunity to tell you that the college is fine. Um, it's ironic that uh, Roland and I, the two of us that are actually in the college, haven't got a college background, but I can see that most of you have got wonderful observatory backgrounds. And the observatory looks fantastic this morning. Um, the college is fine. We're starting to plan how we might reopen and what we can reopen when. So we're doing very slow, steady progress on how we get the college back up to functioning again. And uh, um, I look forward to seeing you all when we get back. Um, but meanwhile, we have this opportunity to run the mini symposium in a different way from usual. I think we um, will all miss the uh, serendipitous interactions that we have and we're trying to create as much of that as we, we can within the session. So uh, thank you to the four speakers as well as to everybody who's been involved in the organization and we'll do proper thank yous at the end. Well it's a very, very great pleasure to introduce Abra Chowdhury who I'm really sad I haven't seen for three months. So it's nice to see him on the screen. And uh, Abra, of course, is, is one of our research fellows in the, in the college, and he's a member of the SBS. Um, and we're really interested to hear, whenever I hear Abra talk, he makes me think about an issue from a different perspective. So fantastic to hear you talk in the current environment, Abra, and over to you. Wonderful. Uh, well, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Denise and, and, and Lindsay, for organizing this. It's an absolute pleasure um, to be here. You know, good morning, everyone. Um, you know, as Denise said, you know, I, I've been part of Green Templeton for uh, over a decade now. I'm a research fellow at the business school. Um, but more, I've been focused a lot um, on you know, areas around climate change and implementation. And more recently, uh, my research has focused on climate finance, you know, uh, generously funded by the British Academy. And so today I'll, I'll talk about a program that I, a project that I've actually started on climate finance. It's in, in process. Um, so I'll show you some early results and some early ideas of what I have been thinking about. So I, I come from Pakistan. Um, and in 2010, 12, um, you know, while I had just come into Oxford, you know, something really tragic happened in Pakistan. We had the great floods, um, you know, over 26, 26 million people are affected. Um, and, you know, one third of the country was underwater, but it wasn't surprising. Um, of course, the scale was huge, but, you know, we are a monsoon um, uh, folk, uh, related area. So every year we have floods coming in. But what was really important uh, when that happened was, and, and this was at the backdrop of, you know, uh, a lot of talk happening around climate change and climate negotiations happening, that, you know, who will bear the cost? You know, where will this, this cost for the damage that came through uh, the Pakistani floods, uh, you know, how, how is that calculated as well? Um, and so the initial cost estimates that came out were, were you know, 10, over 10 billion, around $10 billion. Uh, and then every successive year, it's been like in billions of dollars, which is huge for a developing country uh, to absorb. So the big question came in, you know, who will support um, these, these uh, disasters or these impacts of climate change where, you know, where countries like Pakistan 
have very low capacity to, to absorb these shocks. But also the fact that, you know, this whole debate came in that, you know, countries, developing countries, um, you know, haven't caused uh, um, the impacts or, or, you know, haven't uh, really contributed to the, to the, to climate change per se, but are one of the affected countries. So I think this was happening in the backdrop and, and that kind of raised my curiosity as well to see, you know, what can we understand about what climate finance is, where funding comes from, you know, who's going to support um, looking at, you know, the impacts of climate change. So when I looked at some of the research and when I look at climate finance as well, you know, there isn't a single definition of what climate finance is because it's a very broad term. But broadly, you know, if you, if you look at, you know, the, the, the kind of one convention that comes from the United Nations framework for climate change, it means finance that's aimed at reducing emissions. So a big part of it is on the mitigation side of it. And that's, you know, um, finance needed to reduce the impacts of climate change uh, or reduce uh, the emissions. But also it's aimed at reducing vulnerability and maintaining resilience of humans. And that's the big adaptation side of, of climate change. So when you look at climate change, it's mitigation, adaptation, and most developing countries have always been focused on the adaptation side of it because they rely on, you know, assets and income, which are actually vulnerable to, uh, to climate change. But also they make this argument that, you know, we're not a big contributor for climate change. Hence, you know, funding for adaptation should come about. So, so this debate is ongoing, um, as we say, you know, how much should be funded for mitigation, and how much should be funded for adaptation. Um, so if you look at the initial uh, landscape of climate finance, and it, it's important to understand you know, where this focus on climate funding has been coming from. And it actually started in 1992 when you know, all the countries came together in Rio to talk about climate change. And I think that's when the first time this debate on climate change started. But within that, a really key concept came out, which is called the CBDR, the Common but Differentiated Responsibility. And that's actually underpinned our entire discussion and research and negotiations and work um, on climate change. Um, and what does CBDR mean? That meant that, you know, you know, climate change is a global phenomenon. You know, it affects all countries. So we have a common challenge. We have a common responsibility. And that's also very relevant in, you know, in, in this current health scenario as well, where we're all talking about, you know, it's a common challenge. But also the fact that, you know, not every country has the same capacity to deal with it. So we have differentiated responsibility. And I think that's where this concept of polluter pays principle came in, that, you know, developed countries that they've historically developed, um, you, know, they've, they've, you know, their assets or their, their communities are much more resilient. Um, actually need to pay developing countries for the impacts that are happening. And that's been the, the big underpinning for all climate finance negotiations, because what this meant was that, you know, funding actually has to come from developed countries. Um, and all negotiations have been around like, you know, who should pay how much, which country should pay um, um, a certain amount, you know, what's the definition of developing country? Do we take China as a developing country, we take Saudi as a developing country. So those elements have been ongoing. But generally, this, this acceptance is there that, you know, developed countries and developing countries uh, have different capacities. And then this concept of additionality came in as well. Um, that, you know, developing, uh, developed countries were always contributing, um, you know, through over uh, their official development assistance, the ODAs. And, and there's a general agreement that, you know, every country, every developed country will contribute 0.7% of their GDP. So the big question was, you know, is climate finance additional? And that's what developing countries have always been seeing that, you know, it should not be repackaged as development funding, but it should be additional to what um, um, has historically been, been funded by developed countries. And then there was this whole debate on adaptation versus mitigation, you know, how much money should be spent on adaptation, all developing countries have been demanding more adaptation funding, um, you know, whereas if you look at energy systems and clean energy, that's where mitigation comes in, but also about funding for development that, you know, you can't adapt if you don't have a strong development base. Um, and so what that led to, this is kind of the initial landscape, what that led to was a series of different funds that came in, you know, we had the adaptation fund, the green climate fund, but one of the challenges was that, you know, it was very low capitalization. So, 
you know, a couple of billion dollars, three, four, five, six billion dollars came in, uh, you know, in that early effort, which seems quite, quite a lot, but, you know, in reality is not when you look at the, the cost of climate change running into billions and trillions of dollars. And so what this led to was just this big question, like every year in, in you know, when we have the climate uh, talks, this big question came in, you know, where's the finance? Where is this money? And this is a picture from the 2013 uh, UN Climate uh, Summit where, you know, um, Climate Action Network came in and kind of created this hashtag, you know, WTF, uh, which became quite popular that, you know, saying that we really need to see the money. We need to know where the funds are. Um, and that's been an ongoing debate as well. But what this led to, this kind of impetus led to, uh, and this is where I want to focus my talk more as well, is the Green Climate Fund. And this was a very instrumental um, thing. This is, has been a big success of the climate uh, negotiation, although we all know that, you know, the climate negotiations have gone through many challenges. You know, they, they haven't always agreed on, on, you know, many of those definitions. But one good thing that came out of it was this Green Climate Fund. And this was launched in 2010 by 194 countries, but it really formally began its operations in the Paris Agreement in 2015. And, you know, if you remember this, this kind of famous picture of, you know, all the leaders sitting in uh, holding hands and shaking hands and, and saying that, you know, we've actually gotten an agreement by 194 countries, which is phenomenal. Um, although a lot of people question, you know, how successful Paris Agreement is. Um, and so what the, the Green Climate Fund does is it actually takes money from developed countries and, and then responds and helps um, developing countries uh, deal with the challenges of climate change. It's an independent body with a secretariat in, in South Korea. But what was really interesting and what was very different about the Green Climate Fund as opposed to other funds like you know, the World Bank or IMF, that it had equal representation of developing countries and developed countries on the board. So 12 members each, uh, which meant that, you know, this it kind of um, covered this historical demand of developing countries saying, you know, we need voice in, in climate change. Um, and so the board did this very well. It's operational, it's funding. So far, you know, $10 billion have been pledged. Um, again, it's not a lot of money, um, but only 5.6 billion has actually come in. Um, and, you know, sadly the US pulled out in 2017, um, which meant that, you know, they didn't pay the, the, the two, actually they had committed 3 billion, they only paid 1 billion and they haven't paid the 2 billion that the U.S. committed to pay to the Green Climate Fund, so it really, it's it's it only has about five or six billion dollars that it's using. So what the Green Climate Fund does is, you know, it sets standards, but more importantly, where I'll focus my next slide on is this concept of accredited entities, that it it wants to promote direct access for developing countries uh, to take ownership. Um, and to bring priorities which are important for developing countries. So it was moving away from this kind of traditional multilateral model where, you know, uh, you know, World Bank or other uh, large institutions come into countries, look at priorities and then fund them. Instead, it went the opposite uh, way around. It said, you know, countries should decide what's important for them. It should be a country driven approach. And that's been a key fundamental, um, I would say, st um, uh, structure of, of the Green Climate Fund. And then it also made this commitment that we should fund mitigation and adaptation equally because traditionally there's a huge skew towards mitigation, mitigation funding. And then also this concept of, you know, how do we get other external uh, funders to come in? But direct access is one of the key elements that I want to discuss further. <clears throat> so if we look at the GCF architecture, you know, we have the Green Climate Fund sitting on top. We have programs and projects, uh, you know, at, at, at the bottom. Uh, and within that sits these accredited agencies. Um, and these accredited agencies are basically government entities or large NGOs or, you know, private sector uh, organizations. And the, the way to access fund uh, for Project for Green Climate Fund is that, you know, these organizations go through this accreditation process, which is a very stringent process. Once they're approved by the Green Climate Fund, they can actually develop projects and then apply for the Green Climate Fund for any projects. Um, and basically the Green Climate Fund should not uh, focus on what the type of projects are coming in, but, but basically look at, at monitoring 
those uh, those projects. And the reason why this was done was because you know Green Climate Fund or GCF recognized that they, they want to reduce their transaction costs. They can't implement projects on ground. They're not like the World Bank because you know it has its own kind of machinery and a huge amount of overheads actually go into maintaining um, you know that that structure. So the idea was let's get countries to do this directly, but also have like an equitable and balanced distribution of funds and then set up some mechanism for accountability. So, so far we have like 95 entities that have been accredited, um, you know, 45 of them are national, but you know, at the same time, while the whole focus was to, to promote national entities, um, they're, they're also about like, you know, 55% are international organization. And these are conventional players like the World Bank, the UNDP, that the Green Fund, fund you know, has also allowed that they can also apply for, for projects directly, which kind of moves away from this kind of concept of the Green Climate Fund really focusing on national entities. Um, and we'll, I, I'll explore that a little bit further in, in uh, my research. So what am I doing in this project? My focus or my interest has been on the role of intermediaries. And these are the accredited agencies, entities that I kind of briefly mentioned um, that have been approved, but also other entities um, in the GCF. And, and I wanted to see how, you know, what role they play in shaping global climate finance activities in developing countries. And that's a really, really important aspect because now because the GCF isn't directly involved in selecting projects or implementing projects, it are these actors that actually sit in between the Green Climate Fund and nation states. And they decide, you know, what will be funded, what projects uh, should go forward, you know, what ideation should, should come in place. Um, and in a way they can actually impact and influence the very existence of activities in developing countries. So I define uh, intermediaries as middle actors, which are these accredited agencies and other entities that actually sit in between global uh, climate finance institution, that is the GCF, and then developing countries. And they also sit between climate finance and implementation, and they play a crucial role in bridging the implementation gap in developing countries. Uh, and so they're the ones who, who come in and, and help with the implementation side. Um, and there are also a lot of other entities that are involved in this process. You have consulting firms, you have lots of investment firms, you have project managers, you have advisors, you have research organizations, you have academic institutions like Oxford, like I am focused on um, also participating in some of these activities. So in a way, my research also shapes what, what happens and what doesn't happen. Um, and so, you know, there are all these entities which are not really accountable, but, but shape that process. And there's a whole range of public, private, civil society entities that are involved in it. I'm not going to go a lot in the methodology because I'm just, you know, in the process, but I've been looking at a lot of the GCF database. I, you know, I've done literature review and I've started interviewing all these uh, different entities as well to understand what role they're playing, what challenges um, do they face uh, in the implementation side of it. So, so quickly, um, um, the first thing that I did in, in this kind of research was looking at what the roles these intermediaries play. Um, and in my research, I found that, you know, there are kind of four key roles that these intermediaries play. They act as knowledge providers. So because we don't have a lot of information on, on climate change, they help us with that information of what climate change is. They're brokers. So they help us provide a platform to connect different actors. And this is where the accredited agencies have a key role to play because, you know, they're looking at, you know, who other actor, which other actors are there. Can we bring in them uh, in that process as well? But then also they play a really, really important role of this ideation project designers. And that's where the whole idea of, you know, what projects need to be created and what are the technical as aspects, how should they be designed? Um, and, and so intermediaries play that role. But then finally, they are also implementer, implementers. So they need to implement those projects on ground. And that's where they bring those capabilities. So I wanted to talk about, you know, some of the initial results that I, I've looked at, and I'm, I'll discuss these quickly, these three uh, propositions uh, that have come in. And the first proposition that I, I saw when I analyzed all the different intermediaries, all the different fundings that are happening, that the GCF funding, despite its commitment to be uh, foc sorry, focused on 
national entities um, is really dominated towards these international entities. And so if you look at the funding that's happened, we see that you know, 94% of the funding has still gone to international entities. Um, you know, the top 10 uh, funding entities are all international entities. Uh, there's very few national and regional entities. And part of the reason is because GCF wants to show impact. Um, and they're used to working with international organizations. So hence they always, you know, go towards these international organizations. Organization. Um, and so that's one of the things that's coming in that, you know, despite these commitments, we see a huge skew. The second element is, you know, which I feel is that, you know, as we go along, the pipeline of projects for national intermediaries like national organization will slow down. And, and the reason is uh, that it's a capability issue. We don't have, when I looked at all those different roles, I don't see a lot of roles present at the national level. You know, it's really difficult to create projects, to create ideation, and then to implement those projects. And those capabilities are not there at the local level. The international accredited agencies with their global support, with their resources, have all these different roles within the same organization. Hence, they're easier picking for the Green Climate Fund. You know, they want to implement projects, they'll go towards um, international organization. So what that creates is it creates a virtuous cycle for international entities um, and they keep getting more and more projects. So that's something that's quite alarming as we go along. And then finally, um, what I see is that, you know, there's a, although the, the green uh, GCF committed to an equal contribution of between adaptation and mitigation, um, we see that that's really not happening. And the reason is that, you know, adaptation, which is the focus of national uh, entity is the focus of developing countries has historically been very hard to quantify. Mitigation, on the other hand, is has CO two equivalence. You know, it's easier picking. We'll see a lot of funding go, going towards clean energy because it ticks all those criteria. But those are important, but not always relevant. They don't help, for example, with the with the flood element of it. Um, and and so that's a challenge that we're seeing as well because some of the key roles are missing. We don't have intermediaries working on adaptation side. We have lots of intermediaries working on the mitigation side. So in summary, this is an exciting project because you know, GCF offers us a unique opportunity to study one of the largest public climate funding as it evolves. You know, it's very rare that you get to see these new uh, uh, structures come in. So I'm very curious to see that. Intermediaries are really, really important because they shape which projects get funded, how these are funded and what geographies these are implemented in. And, you know, uh, my kind of three propositions, unfortunately sh show that, you know, despite all the, the good efforts, we still focus on business as usual, unless and until we don't really focus on national entities or national projects, we'll suffer from, you know, not moving away to this kind of uh, country driven approach. And we still see a lot of dominant dominance of, international intermediaries, um, you know, which is, a, which is good for climate action, but, but challenging to develop um, national ownership. And so my next steps are, I'm, I'm conducting this huge survey of, of entities to understand what roles are missing. Um, so thank you so much. I only have gone a few minutes over, but um, thank you for your, for your time and attention. And ready for any questions. Thank you very much, Abra. I would like to ask one, if I may, um, with regard to adaptation, how long do you think it will take to develop intermediaries to a suitable level? You know, uh, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's, there's historically been a lot of work that's gone on, on adaptation. I think one of the challenges is that his, historically adaptation has been taken over by development organizations. So you'll see lots of NGOs, you know, lots of development organizations that, that are involved in that. Generally, they don't have a lot of capacity, so they're project-based. Um, so what really needs to happen is, the only way that this can happen is when we actually spend a lot of resources, a lot of time, uh, you know, a lot of effort in really focusing on adaptation, not saying, okay, it's difficult, let's just move on to mitigation side, then it will create some, some momentum. 
it's ongoing work. I'm not saying that there isn't a lot of work happening, but it's difficult to give a time frame. but it can only scale up when we make this a key priority. And when we have private sector come in as well and try to focus on, on you know, ideas which are much more sustainable. So it's difficult to say when, but I think we should have a pathway where, you know, the Green Climate Fund should make a priority saying, you know, no, we really have to focus on adaptation. Um, and even though we have other attractive projects, let's just not go towards that direction because other people can fund it. We don't need the Green Climate Fund just to focus on mitigation. Right. Thank you very much. Yes. Sorry, a rather lengthy question to ask to answer. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a, I... it's a big challenge. Yeah. Um, oh, we have to, we now have a question from Roger Street. To what extent is the process for seeking funding um, something established by the international community established um, a barrier, has established a barrier, I think is what he means. So if I, if I understand the question, I, I know the intent behind, for example, GCF um, and these fund, funding, you know, is, is there to, to basically break those barriers. So having developed countries and developing countries sit on the board, like for example, this, this term Pakistan is the chair. So they, they can play a very instrumental role in shaping what gets funded or not. But you know, at the same time, there, are, there is institutional inertia. There are these challenges, there are these kind of barriers. You know, the, the Green Climate Fund, for example, has, has completed its five years. Now it's seeking its next uh, funding cycle. So what it really wants to do is show impact. And the moment you want to show impact, you, you tend to focus on projects uh, and ideas which are, you know, which, are, which have been done. And, and so this kind of whole structure goes back to, you know, reinforcing or perpetuating the same cycle of going with traditional multilateral organization. Like, you know, do we need the World Bank to be getting funding for Green Climate Fund where it itself funds green cl uh, climate initiatives? And I think some of those questions are, are really important um, and, on, and need to be addressed if we really truly want um, uh, 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 a process which, which you know, kind of breaks down those barriers. Actually, it creates those barriers because it takes away uh, capacity from local organizations um, because funding has gone somewhere else. I know it's going to take time for local capacities to develop, and but you know, climate change is long term, and we do have to be patient in saying you know we we need to spend money in country rather than having those those institutions involved. So, I don't know if I've answered your question, but. Yes, those institutions are creating those barriers by being involved in that process. Okay, um, we do have to move on, but I think we have time for one brief question, if you could give a brief answer from Alex. Are there any GFC rules to ensure international intermediates involve national actors? You know, that's a great question, and that's it, exactly my next step of uh, research. There isn't. Um, you know, it's not explicit. And the case that I want to make is that all international uh, intermediaries, if they get any project, they should be mandated to involve local entities uh, with a timeline of saying, you know, we will actually step back. Um, and I think that that actually is, is a great way forward. I know it's going to be challenging because international entities come and say, you know, we want speed, we want to implement and we, we, we can't work with local entities, they don't have the capacity. But unless and until we don't involve them, we don't build that capacity, it will never happen. So that's my kind of next focus. That's the interview that I'm doing to really find out that question. So thank you for, for posing that question. Thank you very much indeed for your talk, Abra, which is really interesting. Um, we now need to move on to the next speaker. Um, this is a reprise. This talk is a reprise of one given in 2018. It was very popular and thus it seemed a good idea to hear it again. So I'm asking Professor Roland Rosner to present Only Connect, a brief history of .ac.uk. So here's my unofficial title. Let's move on. This is the contents um, list. Uh, so the context and motivation for networking in the academic community, some 
uh, a little bit of, of pseudo-technical stuff, for, which would be too simple for the aficionados and too complex for uh, less aficionados. Then the, the development program, which I was involved in, from the translating the uh, ambitions into, into practice. Then a great leap forward over about 20 years to now, and then some memorable moments and obser observations and reflections. So uh, I feel slightly uh, pr pretentious uh, being part of a, 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 an advertised research seminar, but never mind. Um, modern history, I understand, dates from the 17th to 18th centuries. My talk is really concerned with network archaeology from about 1975. So I guess it's uh, modern archaeology of, of data networking. Uh, it's not difficult, or maybe it is difficult, to imagine what it was like before networks were around. No emails, no trolls, fake news outlets, out, and uh, fake news outlets. Uh, I hope to give an idea in this talk about what the early days were like in that uh, barren landscape, uh, how much had to be developed, decided, and funded in order to build the foundations of what we have today, and we take it for granted. So. Let's look at the, the computing environment in UK academy, academia around 1976, when I first got involved in this, in this game. Uh, computing was uh, funded by uh, Department of Education agencies. Um, the Computer Board funded uh, local computer, computer centres in universities and also some national uh, computer centres for people who had more demanding uh, comp computational requirements on the campuses and the research councils funded um, uh, central uh, mainframes for their particular research disciplines. So we had three slides now. This is, these are the links from universities to national centres. You can see these are the centre of stars. This is Bath, this is London, this is Manchester, this is Cambridge. There was one in Newcastle and there was also one in, in Edinburgh. And all these universities had links, largely uh, card, card readers and line printers to uh, these national, la uh, high, high, higher, more higher powered centres. Um, the research councils, similarly Rutherford, um, Bath and um, Manchester, sorry, this is Darsbury and this is Edinburgh. They also had links from university researchers funded by the research councils to do their computation at these powerful centers. So if you put those together, you get this complex, it's a real mess. And this is one of the things that the uh, funding agents were interested in, in looking at um, when, when, uh, at the, in, in 1976. So the funding body's w mission was to widen access, as we've seen there, and they saw da data networking as a means of achieving this. And they in instigated a survey of computing and data communications across the community, the, the, the universities and the research councils. And I was involved in that. And in 1979, they, we recommended in, in our survey, we recommended that the funding bodies establish uh, coordinated and funded projects in order to implement a, a, a network development program. And I actually led that, so uh, I was uh, deeply involved all, at all stages. So here we are now, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, basics of, of networking. Obviously, they, the first, first thing to do is to establish a link between you and the and your destination and we all know about bits and bytes uh, being traveling along li uh, along links and in those days um, not all these me mechanisms existed copper was there but fiber optic was only just coming in wireless was there but not for this particular uh, application and and of course satellites data is split into packets and the individual packets contain addresses so that they can be addressed from uh, source to destination uh, via routers. By analogy with the telephone system for voice traffic between people, we, you, we, we, we like to think of addresses as being something which, we, which, we, uh, which has a name, so we have directories. But of course, for computers, you need uh, numeric addresses so that routers can determine where a, a packet has to be uh, sent and you need a server which is uh, uh, the equivalent of the old yellow book uh, and, and, B and British Telecom 
uh, uh, directories which translates new um, numeric translates the name of a, a, a destination into a numeric address. At the higher level, by analogy with human com communications, you assume when you call somebody that you are speaking and, and, and listening to the same language. So you, if that's not the case, then you have to have some intermediary, an inter interpreter, uh, to, to translate. Similarly, if you're, if you're speaking to somebody who is in the same uh, specialist field as you, then you don't need to start at the, at the basic level. You, you assume the shared use of ex expertise jargon. I'm now going to switch on the clock and I've realized that it's, uh, I've already, so we go, go back to that slide. I knew that I'd do that. So by, anal by analogy with, uh, with, with, with human uh, human communications we need to uh, uh, find a means not not assuming anything about the uh, about the the destination the destination of a, 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 an application when you when you use an app then you, you the corresponding app to which you're talking remotely you both need to uh, a, a, have an agreement of a, st a, a standard for uh, interpreting the information that's coming across the network and that's those are the high level higher level communications so if we look at what was required in order to get from the the, the stage that you saw on that third slide of, of lots of least lines very low very uh, very low speed le least lines to a network then one of the decisions we had to make was were we going to establish our own single wide area network for the for the community or to, uh, were we going to uh, use a, a public uh, a public system at that stage the post office which had just started in, in when I when we were working on this in 1976 had just become separated into British Telecom and Royal Mail and we spent a lot of time negotiating with British Telecom about what they might provide they did have a, a an experimental packet switched network but there were huge uncertainties about the the, the use of that that uh, public network uh, in terms of, of how long it was going to take to establish and uh, get up to up and running and what the tariffs were likely to be and they would still retain the monopoly over switching so we then studied the, the idea of a private network which would be free at the point of usage which is very important when you consider how how, how much usage was, was anticipated and we wanted to have control over the switching so if you remember the third the, the third slide complex side of lots of lines there was actually an, an embryonic re research council network and it was agreed that the, that the research council science research council as it then was agreed that they would hand that over for use by the academic community that was a momentous decision it's it it, it lives with us today and that the, the large part of the success is that the, the, the network is a private network and we called it Janet. Janet was actually my secretary, and we back back engineered the name Janet to mean the Joint Academic Network. Joint was being the computer board and the research councils, so the Joint Academic Network was born in 1984. We also needed other infrastructure components. I won't go into details. Ironically, it was much. Uh, there was much more attention given to wide area networks than local area networks. Of course, that's been a big thing since then, but I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Uh, the name registration scheme is what I mentioned, the, uh, the directory scheme for translating um, name, human, human friendly names of sources and destinations into uh, the, the, uh, the, the numbers which were needed for network communications. So then we come to the higher level and there, there were no standards at that stage for, for example, uh, sending files from a, a source a, a, a machine to a destination machine. And there were lots of other functions like, send, like uh, uh, email, like job transfer, like um, character mode, uh, line, line mode terminal, uh, traffic so we had to, we had a, a program of defining 
uh, standards for all these various functions, a set of books which were called colored books, uh, which were um, widely used in the academic community. It was remarkable how, how we, uh, we, 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 uh, we, we managed to make, make those. And that was without any, any sort of uh, consideration for other, other developments elsewhere. And of course, in the States, uh, the ARPANET was developing a, a, a similar stack of protocols to the ones that we were using. And because the, the, the close links between uh, DARPA, which was an, uh, a, a military, industrial, and, and uh, an academic uh, uh, collaboration, they developed this, this stack of protocols which were implemented by a number of the large American uh, computer manufacturers. Um, there was a lot of discussion about, how, about whether the, the UK coloured books or the DARPA TCPIP stack should be the international standard. And there were a lot of religious wars, and I've chosen this particular one uh, to illustrate um, the, the difficulties of getting agreement on, on protocols. Um, when we come to addressing, we call it, we, the, the, the address has been adopted, the, the addressing has been gtc.ox.ac.uk. Why isn't it uk.ac.ox.gtc? UK That's because the international committee has decided that the uh, the the DARPA form uh, the DARPA form uh, the low end the low endian it's called the little endian uh, would would hold sway. Anyway, when we were still using the coloured books, we had contracts with experts throughout the community and in industry both to do the, 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 the definition and to implement the, those protocols on the various different types of host computers that we had. And one of the conditions that we applied was that uh, manufacturers in order to sell their devices would have to comply with, that, with those protocols as a condition of procurement. Now, of course, all that went out of the window when we had to, uh, or we didn't go out of the window, but we had to change from um, the, the vendor's implementation of the TCP IP US protocols, uh, we had to convert what we'd done with our colored books to the PCP IP stack. So there was a period of transition. Everybody knows about the Brexit transition this year. Well, that was a similar one. Uh, I think it was about just, just about as long. But in the event, all those converters had to be ditched as we went straight to um, the, the uh, the the, uh, the 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 new protocols on new machines. So then we come to uh, the great leap forward. This is now stepping literally about twenty odd years, because I think that that's where the discussion is going to be. Um, this is what the backbone of of the Janet network. Compare this with the 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 third slide that I showed earlier on with the. Uh, higgledy piggledy web of, of, of networks. This is what the Janet uh, network looked like in July 2019. That's a year ago. And some of these slides here, if you think about the uh, traffic, the, 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 the line speeds in those, in those uh, early days between 1.2 kilobits and, and 48 kilobits, these are networks of this one here is six times a hundred gigabits. Uh, so you can see this is just absolutely huge. And in 20 years, we've just jumped from uh, 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 different, different sorts of universe. So I've actually covered a lot. Um, let me just talk about some memorable moments. Um, we were deeply involved uh, early on in in the in these 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 proto these uh, particularly UK protocols, I remember in those early days somebody came to me. Ha uh, I hadn't thought about it at all. In fact, one of the things that I I, I I'm a, a little bit um, uh, uh, have to admit is that um, I've been very at, very bad at for at, at forecasting what might happen to technology. I completely. Uh, and I've been bowled over by a couple of things. Um, for example, I never thought about really about um, email and somebody tackled me in the, in the corridors at UCL and said, what are you going to do about email? Well, it wasn't called email then, it was called 
mail across ele uh, uh, electronic mail. So that that was a, a a a real point where I had to give you know, put my thinking cap on. And the other thing was twelve years later when I first came across the World Wide Web, and that was a real uh, a real wow for me. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so what what was what were the secret of our successes for this this network, um, the network development? I think in talking to people who, who come from a, a, a health background, an NHS background, one of the things we, we, we sought to do was to, right from the start, to involve um, the, the, the experts with, across the community uh, to have some stake in what we were doing by, getting the, by giving them contracts to do uh, work which would benefit from their expertise um, and, and they then had some some stake in in in, in what, what happened to the in, in, in the in, an interest in the in the uh, in, in in serving the community. Um, so by doing this, we created a cadre of network experts, um, and one we we put a great store into running network shops. Those started as um, once every two years. And they became so successful that uh, we, 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 we held them once every year. And remember, this had to, these had to be organized before we had email to uh, help us on our way in, uh, in organizing conferences, let alone Teams and, and, and Zoom to, do, uh, to, to, to have remote communications. Um, so this cadre of network experts who emerged, emerged from our development program is, I think, uh, largely explains how the Janet network has become a, a world leader in the uh, um, in, in the in, in, in the provision of, of networking for the for academic communities across across the nation we think that I think that we were particularly successful where computer services in universities were closely al allied with their their uh, corresponding computer science departments a lot of the protel protocol research work was done through collaboration on campus between those kinds of experts of course of course in the 20 year, 20 or so years that uh, i've just jumped over uh, there have been massive uh, advances which have been uh, taken advantage which which have been chicken and egg some of the advances that have been made in in, uh, in in technologies have benefited networking, and the advances in networking have, on the other hand, uh, been responsible for the huge uh, uh, advances in practically every field of, of research and academic endeavor. So we're faced now with, um, and the interesting thing, of course, is the complexity of what we've got, the scale of what we've got, and the ubiquity of, of we've got. And we can see that the, the network is vital for all activities, not forgetting the administration of our, our, our universities. And it's been especially, especially useful in, uh, in the lockdown environment that we, we, we uh, face today. Okay, so finally, uh, I think it's appropriate to uh, show a slide which I showed at my inaugural lecture at University College London in 1995, I said how much I wowed when I first saw uh, the World Wide Web. And I showed this slide to a, an audience which, for which in those days was very new. The fact that you can see the cracks in the ceiling on a, on a slide at the, in the lecture theater at, at UCL, uh, I think that's just amazing. And thanks to Michelangelo for reminding us of uh, our humanity. Thank you very with much time, indeed, with Roland. Some time for chat. Yes, I have. I have a, a good, nice, long question, which I think is the only one we will take, so as not to eat into coffee time too much. Okay, it's from Charles Raw, and he says parallels to the situation of Networks 101, 1976, when post office split into post and telecom. What analogies are there with today's diverse academic schools and networks? How can a common aim for progress be maintained? Is EduRome sustainable? P.S. Great talk. Thank you. 
edgy roam is isn't edgy roam just a a uh, a uh, another means of getting access to your your home your home computer from wherever you are in in in, in academia across the world that's my understanding but i'm not an I, expert. i'd like uh, maybe charles can 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 amplify on that a bit maybe can he, he can put his microphone on and ask me directly hi, uh, hi um, roland thank you very much hi. for your talk can you hear me yeah yeah no um yes it is it, it, maybe sustainable is the wrong answer but um it, it it's a universal access point to to networks but um i, I was just seeing some parallels um to when you expanded on the, the the challenges that you met in the mid 70s with regards to um getting onto a common platform and um to to progress um development and i was just wondering whether we we, we kind of um yeah what, what your advice and your your experience is with um moving things forward in a very diverse and, and now global setting where many stakeholders play into uh, one goal well i think that the 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 the, the network inf infrastructure which we have with all the different kinds of protocols that exist is has been a, a great uh, a, a great communications tool for the individual um, specialist scientific medical and, uh, and all research the, the independent the separate research fields for for those Community, communities to very quickly establish communications with each other and 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 hasten hasten the development of their of their disciplines i mean i'm, I'm still not quite sure what 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 you see what you what what, what the problem what the problem is that uh, i mean i think my 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 philosophy has always been to work bottom up and i think one of the problems of the uh massive projects which for example have been uh, constantly happening in the in the nhs world where uh, the most recent one had sev costing several bill billion the national program for it um, was essentially uh, abandoned because it was top down and it ignored the fact that you've got to have people at the at the at the sharp end with a lot of expertise in the in the individual hospitals uh, giving them a a, a a stakeholder role by and, and making them commit by virtue of, of recognizing that their expertise is valuable and we did that but the nhs didn't it, it sort of imp tried to impose uh, their ideas from the center and that's i think th thought that was a great weakness i think we um we only have time for one more question okay Yes, in 2018, I remember clearly you saying that it was 10 million times faster than 35 years ago. In the intervening two years, has that made any difference? I think it, I, I think it, it has in, in the sense that uh, there are more links at very high bandwidth. So if you've got a, a, a route which is very heavily used, then they just bung in another link. Uh, that, that, that map with the, uh, the, of, of 2018 um we, we, was uh showed already then you could see there were multiple a uh, multiple uh, 100 gigabit links put in so i think the it, the, the the traffic is just getting huge of course the use of the use of networks during the long during the uh, the the lockdown has been huge for for uh, for in, in just just in universities to, to to say nothing about the about business. I mean, I I speak to, to to businesses where all the all the staff are working from home, so the network, uh, the the use of the network for Zooms and Teams and so on is is generating massive amounts of traffic, um, and. Uh, we're worried when going back to um, our, our, our converted barn in, in Kent that our um, 10 megabit link will be heavily satur saturated by a small hamlet uh, <laughs> using you, you making much use of the network than, than they were doing when we were last there at Christmas. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Roland. That was a lovely talk. I would like to introduce the next talk, which is by Professor Charles Raw, who is Clinical Director at the National Perinatal Epidemiology Unit.
Charles is going to talk to us on the birth of the International Neonatal COVID-19 Consortium. Charles, the floor is yours. Thanks, Lindy. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me to speak and for the very kind introduction. Um, I would, I'm, I'm excited to, to share with you the um, developments of which I was part of recently, um, sparked off by the devastating COVID crisis. Now, um, I, I, I'm a neonatologist, so I care for, for newborn babies, uh, preterm babies and term-born babies for the first month of their lives, basically, which is slightly different from pediatricians who, who follow babies or children up to uh, adulthood. Um, I, I'm um, good friends and in contact with Anna Lavizari from the University of Milan who uh, I share a research interest uh, in neonatal lung function. And um, we, we had many a collaboration and we, we just happened to be in contact at the start of the COVID crisis together with a couple of other quite enthusiastic and inspiring people. Um, first and foremost, Eleanor Molloy, professor of um, neonatal pediatrics in Dublin Trinity College. Um, Add into the mix um, a good friend of mine, Klaus Klingenberg, professor of pediatrics at the Northern University in uh, Norway, in Tromsø. John Sopanik from uh, Harvard University and Jochen Profit from Stanford University and myself. And we all happened to be at a neonatal conference at the end of February when it became apparent that the Chinese born um, viral illness that we now all know as COVID-19 was about to sweep over to Europe and had hit the hotbed uh, around um, Lom Lombardy and Milan. So we were in um, Jeddah of all places in Saudi Arabia and I'm now destroying all my street credibility as a researcher by showing you that we not only were partaking in a fabulous scientific program, but also in quite a nice social program. And whilst we were sat there and enjoying the hospitality of our great hosts um, and some saber dancing, etc., we also did quite some intense discussion on what's going to happen, uh, uh, what is about to happen in Italy and um, what will be happening in Europe all together with COVID hitting us as hard as, as it has hit China and the Wuhan province. So the global situation today is that we have bemoan more than seven and a half million COVID cases globally and near to 500,000 deaths. Uh, and as you know, these figures are ever increasing on a daily basis, despite the little progress we make in the European pockets. Looking at my patient group, which is the newborn infant, there is a, still a scarcity of knowledge on how hard COVID actually affects babies. And a review of uh, the Chinese 250 cases of uh, babies in, from the Wuhan province and from Hong Kong, as well as American and now fresh off the press uh, UK data seems to indicate that newborn infants very, very, very thankfully do not seem to suffer greatly from COVID, nor do they seem to be virus carriers with any huge infectious potency. However, we didn't know that in February 2020, and we were prepared for one of the worst crises to hit us as a profession of neonatal intensivists. Um, and knowing farewell what efforts went into the Nightingale hospitals and what's been happening on the adult intensive care front, we were prepared for a similar hit on the neonatal front. Similarly, having met in uh, Saudi Arabia and interacting with a lot of people around the Middle Eastern um, region, we, we were well aware that um, whatever we would be struggling with here in our high income setting, uh, the low and middle income countries would be hit um, exponentially harder. The global situation in February, March 2020, um, shown in these two graphs on, on your left hand side, you see the cases per thousands of um, COVID infection. And on the right hand graph, you see um, the cases um, and the deaths per thousand um, over a time frame between January and March 
2020. Um, we, we know the yellow line represents China and we know that the Chinese have uh, contained the disease very well from a rapid onset to a plateau and uh, we, will, we, we now know that China is almost disease free. And we see the exponential rise that we uh, witnessed at the time of lockdown here for the UK, for the USA, Italy, um, etc. So we were, um, the, we, and I say these five um, colleagues of mine, which I showed you earlier, we were very, very, very aware that we needed to do something to um, help all our colleagues around the world uh, to be prepared for the worst wave to hit. Some suggestions in the neonatal field um, were highly controversial and that was due to fear for disease spread and affecting um, key, key uh, workers and doctors as, as, as much as newborn infants and the vulnerable mothers. And if you just let this image sink in of a fully personal protective equipment geared up doctor or nurse person who shows this equally geared up um, and mask uh, protected mother to look at her infant on a screen in a different room totally separated from her newborn child in this case a preterm child that was also on respiratory support it's very clear that this kind of um, scenario could only be maintained in a high income country but still it would be a disaster for any family to be separated by such extreme measures from the newborn child. So for the lack of any reliable epidemiologic data applicable to high income countries at the start, and of course, low and middle income countries, um, for, for a lot of angst around vertical disease transmission from mother to the fetus, from uh, the delivery room setting where there's a lot of bodily fluids flying around and not only talking about aerosols but all sorts of things. There, we, we as a profession of uh, obstetricians, midwives and neonatologists feared that we were in the, um, in the focus of, uh, uh, of being very much exposed to COVID and potentially infected. So um, we had to tackle a lot of issues around obstetric management neonatal management and family management and thus we set out to uh, to go and uh, see what intelligence we could find out there and what guidance we could find and gather to communicate to the neonatal community um, through uh, scientific reports and educational activities. So our objectives uh, as a group were to together international protocols and to compare these uh, and to look into how different settings, starting from China and going into Italy, the core person here was Anna Lavizari in Milan, and uh, other healthcare providers and systems dealt with the um, emerging problem of increasing cases of positive mothers um, giving birth to children. And we analyzed these guidelines um, and we presented them um, through different uh, outlets. And the long-term aim is, of course, to see how this initiative can be used as uh, an alliance for disease preparedness should a disaster like this happen again. So to look at uh, project one, which was the gathering of intelligence and the comparison of uh, protocols, we, reached, we um, did a pragmatic survey by which we reached out to 20 of our um, well-chosen friends and allies. I'm heading a research society at the European Society for Pediatric Research. So we handpicked those people who could, uh, who we knew who dealt with the COVID um, pandemic in Germany, in Italy, in France, in Spain, um, and we, we went for a, a high income country representation, including America, Canada, and also um, affluent parts of South America and Africa and um, the Middle East. And we um, asked the stakeholders in these um, regions to give us information on the pandemic state and the prevalence of COVID in the country and their measures to tackle this on a national level. We only 
chose one week of um, data collection uh, in the middle of March because we wanted to um, have the, the data available and share this uh, as we went along and we wanted to compare the ad hoc process of um, uh, disease preparedness. This is the map of the countries which we included and uh, as you can see there's a very strong um, first um, and high income country uh, predominance here and um, uh, with the exception of uh, Brazil on large but we only uh, focused on um, densely populated area regions of uh, Sao Paulo and um, Rio de Janeiro and in Argentina we looked at um, the capital as well. Um, and we, we contacted uh, a number of people and we gathered their, their protocols. We had a very 100% uh, recall rate because we uh, identified and approached these people independently. Um, this project uh, is, is in um, publication. We've uh, got an accepted um, manuscript, but it is currently not um, in print. Uh, as you can see from the long list of um, completing, uh, sorry, of contributing authors, it's a collaborative effort where we gave everybody who kindly shared their protocols and gave input into our project um, co-author status and um, Nature Publishing Group, who is the publisher for the Journal of Pediatric Research, is currently kind enough to prepare a um, manuscript which has 31 co-authors. So we're looking forward to celebrating this um, state of international comparison of early guidelines for managing um, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic in neonates. This leads me on to the second project um, which mirrors the first project and the key components of the questionnaire which we rolled out in the high uh, income countries looked at care organization, the centralization of care for uh, mothers and newborn infants, the direct uh, nitty gritties of how to deliver newborn infants in the setting of suspected or proven COVID and the care that we have to provide for babies and mothers after birth, uh, both in the preterm and neonatal intensive care unit um, and on the uh, obstetric and observational units. Um, as you can imagine, caring for not only infants but families is complex, so um, we have the complex task of seeing a lot of um, finely granulated uh, attempts of uh, protocolization. Without going into too much details, uh, I have the details for you if you have specific questions, but in the interest of time I will only um, uh, give you the the major headings which we chose, so um, the perinatal and neonatal care, how it was organized through the obstetric field and the neonatal field, um, the common ground which we share with obstetrics, midwifery and um, neonatology is of course the delivery room where we all meet and interface, NICU management which includes the treatment of preterm infants and infants born with um, disease, and of course, how to integrate the families um, to allow them maximum access to their babies were things that we focused on. So to summarize project one, we saw that there was a considerable variation in individual practice and protocols. However, um, there were also some um, considerable similarities which we believe stems from the fact that um, viral disease is not uncommon um, and vertical transmission is um, always considered in the context of birth and HIV pandemic has taught us a lot about this. Um, but the, the diversity in protocols which we encountered clearly highlighted that there was absolutely no knowledge on the actual disease burden and the actual prevalence of um, vertical transmission or even horizontal transmission in the first couple of days of life. Um, and the diversity which we found also highlighted that um, 
with, with a pandemic like COVID-19, um, and, and I'm sure we, we will see another one, at least in my professional life, we, we need to have means how to tailor a unified response and not an individual response as soon as possible. So that's where we lead into project two. Um, we, we, of course, looked into why these things happened and some of which I'm, um, I may have said before, as with any guidance or guidelines, uh, they are only as good as the evidence that's underlying. And the evidence, however good it is, is also um, open to interpretation. So whilst we may all be reading the same high, middle or low grade quality, we will always um, be prone to our interpretation of the science. And when it comes to implementation, um, we, we are always bound to the local context, the disease burden in the local setting, um, the local setting itself, the uh, healthcare resources we can allocate to uh, disease containment, etc. So um, we found, and we were very, very um, interested to learn from colleagues around the world, how all of these different aspects um, of evidence assessment, local scenarios and, um, and allocation of funds went into developing protocols uh, for disease containment. Um, Milan, as you know, um, as the hotbed of COVID-19 has now um, slowly released its uh, lockdown um, and we are grateful to learn, to have learned that not a single newborn infant died uh, of COVID in the process of the pandemic um, hot, uh, in a hotspot like Milan, but a lot of thanks needs to be said to the healthcare workers who um, maintained Milan safe. Uh, for mothers and children. The outlook for uh, project two looks at how we can uh, extend the experience which we learned uh, from more affluent countries into the low and middle income country setting uh, and disease containment of COVID-2. The same group um, that met in Jeddah um, here in the center, uh, John and Jochen, who are both from um, from the United States, uh, Stanford and Harvard um, are the driving forces in um, the uh, second part of our project where we're reaching out to, um, to find a global consortium. Um, 25 countries uh, and neonatologists from six continents were involved in the first part of our project, but in project two, we are taking um, this to a higher level. The lessons learned and the confusion which we all suffered from uh, during project one um, have educated us a lot and helped us refine our questionnaires with which we reach out to a much larger group of neonatologists and colleagues in the field. The disease has also progressed and we've learned much about the disease progression. Um, this graph which mirrors the graph I showed you earlier is now from the middle of May 2020 and it shows how China and other countries have contained the disease very well, but affluent countries like North America and Europe were still battling with an increase in disease burden and death. And low and middle income countries like Latin America, um, Africa and the Caribbean were only just beginning to feel the burden and the disease only hit the, um, at the end of May. We reached out to a lot of people, um, but we also encountered some, um, some passive resistance. And um, as you can see here in this um, headline from the Wall Street Journal, uh, reaching out to Russia, where doctors happen to fall out of windows if, they, if they're outspoken about the lack of PPE equipment and the disease burden, um, it may not be all so easy. And we found a shocking um, divergence in preparedness to even speak to us. Um, but it's not limited to, um, to what we would consider the um, oppressive states. Also in America, which we now may have a different opinion on than eight years ago, um, there was also a shocking um, suppression of, of, verbal, um, of verbalization for the need for more help. And um, I, can, I can only 
report from personal experience that colleagues in New York City were equally struggling like we in the UK with the lack of PPE. And this is reflected in a number of news reports which you see on this slide. To give you a little, an uplifting message, we've managed to now include 70 countries um, in our collaboration and we did this by moving from having, uh, from approaching individuals um, and stakeholders in the field to identifying nodal stakeholders in by having regional representatives who reach out to colleagues um, in, in the um, different regions of the world. And we now um, have a very nicely spread out network of collaborators who feedback their experience and their protocols for um, disease containment for COVID-19. Um, I acknowledge uh, the individuals which I uh, showed at the beginning of my talk. Um, we are now joined by a PhD student, Sahil Tembulka and, um, and Daniela Ehlert from um, the Cochrane collaboration. And we have many nodal stakeholders in our consortium. What have we learned? Um, we've learned a lot to look forward. Um, we learned that uh, we, are, we were completely unprepared for uh, a pandemic like COVID-19. And this is although we had pandemics, um, or sorry, we had epidemics of viral disease in 28, in 2010, in 2011, um, and in 2015. Um, but these epidemics were contained to local pockets and gladly didn't spread and um, bird flu, swine flu, you know, all the, um, all the acronyms that went with it. But beyond the immediate needs of the regions, we believe that we need to have a systematic approach to um, providing an international stru structure for disease preparedness, to be able to mobilize resources rapidly to um, discover disease spread uh, early and to learn about the uh, phenotype of the disease and how to best um, deal with sick individuals. Um, I would like to propose in this context that um, by the next year GTC with its high emphasis on global health and as to the first speaker in this uh, exciting symposium we also have a lot of expertise in the medical field, in the economic field, um, that we host a um, specific conference or symposium on disease preparedness. Um, and I would propose to put this together for the pediatric and neonatal field. Other things have happened very successfully and um, the diversity of uh, COVID resources, which were which sprung up like mushrooms, have been concentrated by high, high quality evidence approaches from the Cochrane collaboration through, for instance, the Australian Cochrane Centre and international society like the ESPR or others have provided platforms for um, uh, disease registries. So I think a lot of good has happened, but we are still looking ahead and trying to improve. Um, we, we, we've seen the WHO in the focus of a lot of criticism, very undue uh, criticism, but we all know that we, um, we as a profession, as medical profession, need to do our very best to um, help global efforts to be effective on a national and on a local level. For this, the lack of a neonatal consortium was recognized by us and that's why we, uh, as a group, focus towards improving the disaster preparedness for our very small field of medicine. Um, and as you, um, dear listeners, will be aware, the better one is organized, the easier it is to roll out um, platforms, for instance, for therapeutic trials. And the Nuffield Department of Population Health of our university is of course running out such a very pragmatic mega trial, the so-called recovery trial, which is included as of this day, more than 12,000 pa patients of all ages, including pregnant women and infants. And I'm proud to say that I'm the neonatal national lead for this trial 
And it's very exciting to see how the disease burden with the right support from government structures and from colleagues in the field leads to um, the creation of an interventional trial in only nine days from idea to first patient inclus inclusion. And I think this is from a scientific and from a therapeutic point of view, the way forward. This is the end of my talk. Um, I thank you very much for your um, attention and I'm really looking forward to our discussion and your questions. Charles, thank you very much. Um, very interesting talk. I'm particularly interested in Medicine Sans Frontier. I see you have a link with them. It was to do with their um, resuscitation techniques. Have you actually worked with them? Um, sort of been to things that they work on abroad? That's a, that's a good question. Thank you very much, Lindy. Um, I wish I had. That's the honest answer. Um, and I, I, um, I think I will do in the future, but uh, for several reasons, I, I never really managed to go out in the field. But through my scientific interest in newborn resuscitation, we did develop a resuscitation algorithm for Medicine Sans Frontières. And this is currently being tested in the field. And I can't wait to go out to, um, to a field station and see how it is being adapted. Yes, that will be very good. Um, my other interest was, um, I see that you mentioned that there's no COVID in newborns. Um, there's always been a lot of interest in the fact that, that young children and teenagers don't appear to get COVID. Is, is this really so, or is it becoming a problem now? So it's probably not 100% true to say that there's no COVID in newborn infants, but there's so far the disease uh, in the neonatal period, which is from birth to the end of the first month of life, in infected infants <clears throat> who can become infected from the environment, so um, horizontally, seems to be a very mild disease cause, which presents with flu-like symptoms, which, which surpass within a day or two. In older children, ages five to 15, we see a surge of an inflammatory response, um, which can be quite severe and mirrors a disease which is called Kawasaki disease, named after its okay. yeah. disorder. And this goes with um, disease of the vasculature, disease of, uh, of the, the vessels close to the heart, uh, skin disease, um, etc., which can have lifelong consequences. So um, there is disease in children and we, we are prepared for this. And I am, the British Perinatal Surveillance Unit gathers information on a weekly basis throughout uh, from every pediatrician in, in the UK who, uh, and they ask them whether they have encountered patients with COVID and the same happens on a pediatric level. So we will have the figures and the phenotype, the disease presentation in infants and in children much cl more clearly refined through this surveillance um, in, in, in the near future. And we will know much more on uh, on the presentation of COVID in this group. Okay, thanks very much. I now have two questions. Um, one from Chris Winchester. What can we learn from your experience to help us prepare for the next pandemic? And that's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can learn a lot. And the one thing that we need to, I think on, an, on a structural level need to be aware of is um, when the next disease hits, we need to be prepared by having um, the resources allocated to uh, protecting the healthcare workers as much as the environment um, from the disease. So disease containment requires um, allocation of uh, resources. And we cannot be in another situation where we have to wait for four weeks to have the appropriate amount of protective equipment. Um, we also were not well enough prepared or not, not able to take the intelligence on board even on uh, disease um, spread within 
a community like uh, a country like the, like the UK or um, Europe as a as as a um, continent. So I think we 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 have to have an early warning system. And this is not me saying this. Actually, you know, apart from from highly qualified people in the field of, of virology and pandemic research, there's some great article by Bill Gates who allocated a lot of funds at the time of um, the bird flu crisis. And he wrote a couple of very inspiring papers in the New England Journal of Medicine on disease preparedness. And that the, the, the core messages out there are surveillance, preparedness, and resource allocation. Thanks very much. Um, there's another question from David Bilardi. I have a question about the overall aim of the new consortium. Is it preparedness of other diseases or sharing resources or design neonatal trials? Well, all of the above um, with the initial aim of um, being prepared or being, being mm, trying to be on top of the COVID pandemic as it unfolded. Um, and now we can probably take our experience as a blueprint for the next viral or bacterial pandemic to uh, which we, we might encounter. Secondly, whilst the neonatal field thankfully doesn't seem to be badly affected and the phenotype is very mild, I hear reports and I will be in, uh, in, in a meeting with um, doctors and colleagues from Pakistan where I hear that the disease phenotype is slightly different from here in, in, in the UK and where the disease burden in children and infants is higher than uh, expected. So um, whilst we see regional pockets where COVID seems to be very, very uh, aggressive, we might be able to help with our consortium by um, sharing experience or even sharing uh, trials in, in this context. Thanks very much. I think we have time for one more question. Um, if you could give a fairly brief answer, I'm not sure if this is possible. Is there evidence, oh sorry, it's from Peter Burke. Is there evidence that the virus crosses the placenta? Yes, yeah, so with, with a lot of refined viral testing, I think we, we, we have now seen that the viral can, virus can cross the placenta. However, um, this seems to be only shown in, in a handful of individuals, um, which begs the question, uh, what predisposes mother and infant <clears throat> and what, what are the circumstances under which there seems to be um, vertical transmission? It does not seem to happen in every infected mother to, to their fetus. Thanks very much. A great talk, Charles, and of course, very timely these days. Um, we now have to move on to um, the next talk, which is Sandar Tintin. Dr. Sandar Tintin is a Girdler's Fellow, having come from New Zealand, and she is going to give her talk on physical activity, hormones and breast cancer. Is there a link? Sandar, over to you. Thank you, Mindy. So good morning, everybody. I am the Godless Fellow from New Zealand, and I have been here for about 10 months. Today, I'm talking about physical activity, hormones, and breast cancer, which is what I have done so far in Oxford as part of my fellowship. And so my fellowship is funded by the Washington Company of Godless and the Health Research Council of New Zealand. Initially, I proposed to look at the association between physical activity and breast cancer risk and to identify factors that could contribute to this association. My mentors are Professors Tim Key and Gillian Reeves from the Cancer Epidemiology Unit, NAFI Department of Population Health. But when I arrived here, I found out that the first objective has been addressed by a diffuse student from the unit. She found that physical activity significantly reduced the risk of both premenopausal and postmenopausal breast cancer. And a more recent Mendelian randomization analysis also showed a lower risk of breast cancer 
associated with accelerometer measured physical activity. And so my current focus is on the second objective. So as shown in this figure, the association between physical activity and breast cancer <laughs> could be mediated through hormones as well as other biomarkers such as metabolic and inflammatory biomarkers. The mediation may also occur through other mechanisms such as immune response. And physical activity may influence these mediators either directly or through its effect on adiposity. So far, I have looked at the associations between physical activity, adiposity, hormones, and breast cancer in two separate studies. So my study one looked at the associations between hormones and breast cancer, and my study two looked at the associations between physical activity, adiposity, and hormones. And so I'll first talk about my study one and then study two. So why is breast cancer important? It is the most common cancer in women worldwide, accounting for about a quarter of all new cancer cases and 15% of all cancer deaths. And when you look at this map, the wall is pink in terms of breast cancer incidence. It is also pink in terms of breast cancer mortality, particularly in less developed countries. And so this table lists well-accepted risk and protective factors for breast cancer. Many of these factors, such as early menarche, late menopause, and hormone replacement therapy, all contribute to a lifetime exposure to a higher level of sex hormones. So it has been proposed that estradiol, and to a lesser extent, other steroid hormones drive cell proliferation, which facilitates the fixation of genetic errors and, and germline mutation in relevant tumor suppressor genes, such as BRCA1, accelerate the transformation into malignant phenotype. And so it's likely that hormone plays a vital role in breast carcinogenesis. So to refresh your memory, I'll now talk about some hormones and growth factors I have looked at in this research. So first, estrogens and androgens. So in premenopausal women, estrogen is mainly synthesized in the ovaries. And its biosynthesis is regulated by gonadotrophin releasing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. But in postmenopausal women, estrogen is mainly produced in the peripheral tissues, such as adipose tissue and skin, through the action of aromatase. Aromatase converts testosterone and androstenediol produced in the ovaries and adrenal glands to estradiol and estrogen respectively. Estrogen receptor positive breast tumor cells could also express aromatis, leading to the intratumor reproduction of estrogens, which in turn may promote tumor growth. And another one is SHPG. It is a glycoprotein that buys estrogens and androgens with high affinity and specificity, thereby, thereby lowering the bioavailable fraction of these hormones. It also crosstalks with estrogen signaling pathways in breast cancer cells and may exert anti-proliferative and pro-apoptotic action, which in turn may lower breast cancer risk. And IGF-1, it is a polypeptide that regulates energy metabolism and growth. IGF-1 is produced in the liver and its biosynthesis is regulated by growth hormone, releasing hormone and growth hormone. IGF-1 may promote tumor growth and pro progression by stimulating cell proliferation and inhibiting apoptosis, either directly or through crosstalks with estrogen signaling pathways. So many epidemiological studies have looked at the associations between hormones and breast cancer and we now have ample evidence for postmenopausal women showing positive associations with estrogens, androgens, and IGF-1, and a negative association with SHPG, as we expected. But the associations are much weaker and inconsistent, except for IGF-1 in premenopausal women. It is not surprising because premenopausal breast cancer is relatively less common 
and so the sample size in most studies is quite small. Over hormone levels fluctuate throughout the menstrual cycle in premenopausal women. Uh, estrogen has the first peak at around mid-cycle and the second peak in the mid luteal phase. And progesterone has the first small peak in the late follicular phase and the bigger second peak in the mid luteal phase. And testosterone has a small peak at around mid-cycle. Additionally, the proliferative rate of breast epithelial cells is also cyclic and peaks in the late luteal phase. So the aims of my study one was to investigate the associations between endogenous hormones and the risk of invasive breast cancer in both pre and postmenopausal women. I was particularly interested in looking at whether the associations differ by menopausal status and also whether the associations vary by age at cancer diagnosis and by phase of the menstrual cycle in premenopausal women. We used the data from the UK Barbic, which is a very big cohort study involving about half a million adults aged between 40 and 69 years when recruited in 22 assessment centers in England, Wales, and Scotland. We included over 36,000 premenopausal women and over 130,000 postmenopausal women in this analysis. We used blood samples collected at recruitment to measure hormone concentrations and identified incident breast cancer cases through linkage to national cancer and death registries. The median follow-up time was about 7.1 years. We used Cox proportional hazards model to estimate the hazard of breast cancer associated with hormone concentrations. And so here are the results. So we have the estradiol results for premenopausal women only. Because almost all postmenopausal women had a very low level, which was below the reportable range. So we need to not find any significant association between total of free estradiol and the risk of invasive breast cancer. But we found a positive association with total and free testosterone in both pre and post menopausal women. The confidence intervals are wider because the sample size was smaller. And the negative association with SHPG was significant only in post menopausal women. IGF-1 was positively associated with breast cancer risk in both pre- and postmenopausal women, but the association seems to be stronger in premenopausal women. We then undertook subgroup analysis by follow-up time to preclude the possibility of reverse causation, that is, the, the associations we observed before are due to the effect of are not due to the effect of preclinical tumor on hormone concentrations rather than the effect of hormones on breast cancer risk. And so here we did analysis for the two follow-up period, first and second. If we see stronger associations in the first follow-up period, it means that reverse causation is likely. This slide is busy. I just want to point it out that there were no significant differences in the associations between the first and second follow-up period, except for total testosterone in premenopausal women. Here, the association was much stronger in the second follow-up period. It shouldn't be due to reverse causation, but this indicates that testosterone may play a more important role for breast cancer diagnosed at, at a later age. And so we did subgroup analysis by age at cancer diagnosis in premenopausal women. And so as we expected, we found a significant association between total of free testosterone and breast cancer risk for breast cancers diagnosed after age 50 only. We also found a stronger positive association with IGF-1 for breast cancer diagnosed before age 50. And we also did subgroup analysis by phase of the menstrual cycle in premenopausal women. This graph showed 
the geometric mean concentrations of estradiol in women who has breast cancer and in those without breast cancer across different phases of the menstrual cycle. The concentration was slightly higher at mid-cycle and in the early luteal phase among cases. But when we did multivariable Cox regression models, we found that there was a significant positive association between estradiol and breast cancer risk at mid-cycle, but not in other phases of the menstrual cycle. And the difference was statistically significant. So in summary, we found a positive association between mid-cycle breast cancer risk in premenopausal women. The positive association with testosterone was significant only for postmenopausal breast cancer. This includes breast cancer diagnosed after age 50 in premenopausal women. We found a negative association with SHPG only in postmenopausal women. And the positive association with IGF-1 was significant in both pre and postmenopausal women, and the association was stronger in younger women. I'm talking about my study two, which looked at the associations between physical activity, adiposity, and hormones. So it has been suggested that obesity may influence breast cancer risk through its effects on hormones such as estradiol, SHPG, and IGF-1, and also through other biomarkers. But its effects seem to be differential in pre- and postmenopausal women. And many epidemiological studies show a negative association or no significant association between obesity and breast cancer risk in premenopausal women, but they found a positive association in postmenopausal women. And so obesity may have differential effects on hormones. So physical activity reduces the risk of many cancers, including breast cancers. As I said before, this association could be mediated through hormones and other biomarkers, as well as its direct effect on adiposity. Many intervention studies have looked at the effect of physical activity on sex hormones. And a previous data analysis of 18 randomized controlled trials concluded that although the effect is relatively modest, physical activity induces a decrease in circulating sex hormone and its effect, this effect is not entirely explained by weight loss. But when we looked at their subgroup analysis, we found that the trials were quite small, particularly for premenopausal women. And there was only one trial available for free estradiol in premenopausal women. The results related to weight loss after intervention also do not seem to be very conclusive. And so the aim of our study too was to investigate the associations between physical activity, adiposity, and hormones in both pre- and postmenopausal women. Again, I was particularly interested in looking at whether the associations differ by menopausal status and also whether the associations vary by phase of the menstrual cycle in premenopausal women. Again, we used the data from the UK Power Bank and included over 20,000 premenopausal women and over 71,000 postmenopausal women in this analysis. We used the data collected at recruitment, including body size and composition, self-reported physical activity, and hormone concentrations. We also used objectively measured physical activity in a subsample of women who provided accelerometer data four years after recruitment. We then compared geometric mean concentrations of hormones and SHPG across exposure categories using multivariable linear regression analysis. So here are the results. Again, we have the estradiol results for premenopausal women only. And we found that BMI was negatively associated with total estradiol but positively associated with free estradiol. The positive association with free estradiol could be driven by a lower level of SHPG in obese women. I'll show you the SHPG results in my next slides. 
the association with self-reported physical activity as well as accelerometer measured physical activity were very weak compared to those of BMI. And here the dotted line indicates the estimates adjusted for BMI. So we also did subgroup analysis by phase of menstrual cycle in premenopausal women. We found that the negative association between BMI and total extra power was significant mainly in the follicular phase and at mid-cycle. But the positive association with free estradiol was significant at mid-cycle and in the luteal phase. The interaction p-values were also significant. Now, testosterone in premenopausal women. We found a positive association between BMI and total as well as free testosterone in premenopausal women. Again, the associations with physical activity were very weak compared to those of BMI and attenuated after adjustment for BMI. We found similar findings in postmenopausal women. In SHD and IGF-1, we found a very strong negative association between BMI and SHPG in premenopausal women. The association with IGF-1 was nonlinear, with the lowest level observed in the highest BMI group. Again, the associations with physical activity were very weak and attenuated after adjustment for BMI. And the results were similar in postmenopausal women. And so, in summary, we found very strong associations between BMI and hormones in both pre- and postmenopausal women, but the associations with physical activity were very weak. And attenuated after adjustment for BMI. If you want to know more about this study, please have a look at our recent publication in the International Journal of Cancer. So in conclusion, we found significant associations between hormones and breast cancer in study one, and we also found significant associations between adiposity and hormones in study two. But the association between physical activity and hormones were very weak after adjustment for BMI. And so it's likely that physical activity may reduce the risk of breast cancer through its effect on adiposity rather than its direct effect on hormones. So I'll be looking at other biomarkers at the, at, as my next steps. So when interpreting these findings, we should keep in mind that this study mainly involved white women and so the results may not be directly applicable to other ethnic groups. We use the plant samples collected at a single point in time, and so the hormone concentrations, particularly estradiol in premenopausal women, may not reflect their long-term average. And we do not have information on other important hormones like progesterone and androgens other than as testosterone. For study one, we do not have information on hormone receptor status of breast cancer. And study two was a cross-section analysis, and so we cannot establish causal relationship. We also use accelerometer data, which was collected four years after recruitment. So that's all from me, and thank you for your attention. Okay, right. <laughs> Very much indeed, Sander. Um, perfect timing. Um, I have a question, which is the accelerometer data. I see that it was collected four years after the, the study. I'm interested to know whether everybody had the same model of accelerometers. The same model? If, did everyone have the same model accelerometers, do you know? Yeah, um, I think they use the same model of accelerometer. Okay, that, that must have um, led to a vast cost for somebody, presumably. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, yeah. That's why they collected the data only from a subsample of the participants. Just right. percent, I think, yeah. Okay, no, that's, that's sensible. I have one on right now. And it's um, telling see, me that I'm yeah. not <laughs> Thank you. We have a question um, from Charles Raw who says, excellent talk and very good use of large data sets. The prospective trial is very interesting too. 
how many in terms of percentage of the study population how many women had accelerometers and are you confident they were representative of the active group of women yep i think um, the women who were with the accelerometer data were i think slightly younger and more health conscious but i think they represent in general the study population and the data was collected from about i think 20 percent of the study sample okay that's yeah. fine um charles i don't think charles wants to come back on that i think i have another oh, oh just a vague question um i noticed briefly that there was an increase in leptin correlated with obesity um did you did you study the effects of the increased leptin I didn't notice you saying any more about it. No, because we don't have information on that as well, because I could only look at the power markers collected in the, the UK power bank. And oh, so okay. I do not have information on leptin yet. Right, okay. No, plasma leptin is an interest of mine, so. Yeah. Okay, um, right, a question from Keith Frame. Was there a relationship between the accelerometer data and BMI? Yeah, that's a good question, but we didn't look at the association between accelerometer data and BMI, and so we do not know the accurate association, yeah. So that's another study for the future. Yeah, yeah, I could look at that in the future. <laughs> right, I have yet another question. This is from Peter Burke. Re reverse correlation, can you explain this further? At first sight, a rising level of hormone following diagnosis would make it more likely that it was a consequence of the disease rather than the reverse. Have I misunderstood this? Yeah, I think reverse cor correlation means if we, the association we observed are due to the effect of yeah, these preclinical tumors on hormones rather than the effect of hormones on cancer. That's why we, yeah, we wanted to find out whether there is a reverse association. And so we did subgroup analysis by follow-up time. So if we see a stronger association in the first follow-up period, it's likely that this is the effect of preclinical tumors on hormones rather than the effect of hormones on cancer. But we did not find any stronger association in the first follow-up period. And so it's not likely that reverse causation is a problem here. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Sandra. Yeah. I think Thank we you. will now go to Denise for closing comments. Hello. So it's my opportunity to say thank you very much for um, all four speakers. Um, it's, and I particularly like to thank Lindy and all of the team for organizing today's event. I think it's fascinating that um, these, this crisis has made us stop and look at ways in which we achieve events in the college in a different way. And it may be, Lindy, that in future, as well as doing it in the Barclay Room, you also record and make uh, make the, it available to a broader community and I think that would be a wonderful thing for us to think about doing. So can I just say how great it was for uh, Abra, Roland, Charles and Sandra to agree to talk to us today. I'm sorry I couldn't hear all of the talks but I will hear back from others and Roland has already told me it's been a fantastic success. So thank you to you all, thank you to my colleagues for organizing it. I think you're going to, you had a slide, didn't you, Cindy, that said, thank Lindy. you. Thank you, Lindy. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>